Sports. The one place that intrigued me was my first trip to London and the House of Parliament in Big Ben. Now these pictures, you must remember, are more than a quarter of a century old. Now, the thing that amused and, and entertained our boys who were stationed all over England was Westminster Abbey. And there were quite a few Americans who came there to see the sights and see Westminster Abbey. And these are the scenes that uh, I wanted to photograph on one Sunday afternoon. Another area that intrigued me was Marble Arch. The Marble Arch on one Sunday afternoon was full of people. You must remember that London was being bombed almost every night uh, in this particular time. And uh, I was photographing these speakers that uh, were addressing the crowds. Every speaker was speaking on a different subject. But the police stood around and watched. And as long as there were no arguments, and any strong arguments, uh, nobody was hurt. And we, the people in the audience were arguing back with the speakers. But these were just typical shots of how we passed the time waiting for D-Day. Most of the children who lived in England, or a great many, I should say, were sent out of the city. But a lot of them had to re remain behind. But in spite of a war, they managed to find entertainment. <coughs> I was rather surprised to see these children drinking out of community drinking cups that were changed to the fountain. And uh, I'd like to make candid shots of these children so they didn't notice me. But every once in a while, they did. But this youngster is taking a cool drink on a beautiful Sunday afternoon. And we discovered that uh, the uh, St. Paul's Cathedral had been hit several times, but not badly damaged. And of course, one of the other attractions was Buckingham Palace and the gates, which were protected by British troops, not in the bearskin hats which they wore in peacetime, but in full war uniform. And this is the way they paraded up and down. They weren't performing for the camera, but they were actually doing their duty. But you notice the barrage balloons in the background. London had barrage balloons all over the area. And it was said that if it wasn't for the barrage balloons with all the equipment that was being brought into the uh, country, that the islands would sink into the sea, but the barrage balloons, they said, was holding it up. <clears throat> you must remember, too, that uh, food was pretty scarce in London at this time. And it was being brought in whatever way they could and being unloaded. But uh, it isn't often you get a bright day like this in the spring in London. And uh, this was an opportunity to show what the soldiers were doing while they were waiting for the invasion. This is Fleet Street. Discovered this Irish policeman guarding the street, and we saw considerable damage in the area. But soon, we were down on the south coast of England, where we met some of the other correspondents who were scheduled to cross the channel with us. And you'll probably recognize some of the old timers uh, who covered the war at, in that particular time. I was given a shovel to defend myself, and it proved to be a valuable instrument. And here we see Larry Lesur of CBS. Larry Lesur was covering the war for CBS, and so was Burton Becker on the left, Jack Thompson of the Chicago Tri Tribune, Ernie Pyle here. And uh, this is a close-up of Jack Thompson. And this is O'Reilly, Larry O'Reilly of the Associated Press. This is Burton Becker. And we're saying our farewells because we were expected to meet again in Paris. <clears throat> Here on the left, we see Clark Lee of INS and Bill Stoneman, who came from Chicago, from the Daily News. And several other of the correspondents were being boarded aboard a military truck to be taken to the south coast. And we went through small British towns, and life was going on as usual. The people were in the marketplace buying food, and as though nothing was going on. But after a 150-mile ride, that's how we felt riding in an army vehicle. 
We found Plymouth was pretty badly damaged. A lot of the buildings were completely destroyed, but this was found all over the area. Soon we were approaching the dock area and we found these American jeeps ready to be boarded aboard landing craft and you notice the bars that are attached to their bumpers and they're designed to cut wires that the Germans had a habit of putting across the road that would sometimes cut off the head of the drivers. We weren't allowed to wander around the area uh, by ourselves. Each crossroad point was under guard of both an American and a British soldier. And if they wanted to see what you had in your bedroll, you had to show it to them. But this is the care that was taken that the secret of the invasion be kept as long as it could. These are the two men, Wes Carroll of the OWI and Pete, uh, Pete Carroll, and Wes Haynes rather, who were with me and we went aboard an LCI number five. Uh, Pete Carroll here came from Boston and he was a photographer for the Associated Press. And we tried to keep our mind off what was coming and we knew it was going to be a short time before we would be on board. <clears throat> we had our first taste of K rations, which didn't taste bad if you were hungry. And we also were able to see the beautiful countryside in that area. And uh, these are the sort of shots I wanted to bring home to show my family and friends. Pete Carroll was using some of his film to make a few shots himself. And soon, we were down at the docks. And there we found units of the 101st Airborne Division carrying everything they could carry by hand, boarding landing craft that were so heavily laden they had to be pushed off the docks by trucks, as you see in this manner. And these men were being taken out to larger craft and boarded for the invasion. And here we see several units carrying grenades, bazookas. They didn't have uh, uh, an opportunity to load this aboard jeeps that were not fully available at this particular moment. Uh, we were aboard a fleet of LCIs, and here shown with the commander of the invasion group in the center, and the captain on the right, rather the captain of our ship, uh, Lieutenant Patton, was in command of the LCI number five, and we found out that he participated in several invasions in the Mediterranean area. And we felt rather confident that uh, he knew what he was doing. But uh, we stayed aboard this ship for almost five days. This is the commander of the squadron. I remember Lieutenant Patton's name well because we were with him for so long. Wes Haynes was trying to get ready for the trip into Paris. I think he was premature. And these are units of the 101st Airborne Division aboard our landing craft, amusing themselves. And I don't have to tell you who this man is imitating. He was a, a Notre Dame football player at one time, and I was told later on that he was killed in the action. Of course, every ship had a mascot, and ours was no different, but the boys provided for their mascot's welfare <coughs> with the making of a life preserver just like the ones that they wore themselves. And then one afternoon, Lieutenant Patton briefed the crew and told them that we would be sailing that afternoon. And uh, they let out a cheer because this is the job they were waiting for. They wanted to get it done and go home. And here we see the LCI number four with the commander moving out into the channel. And this was a Tremendous sight to see ships from one end of the horizon to the other. Ships of all kinds. They tell me there was well over a thousand ships. But even so, we thought this was just another exercise. As we continued on, we felt that we'd be turned around, go back and try again another day. But when we continued on into the night, we knew it was the real thing. At one time, we had a bit of a scare. They said there was a submarine in the area and one of the DE boats threw some uh, bombs into the channel. And uh, they exploded, but uh, we never saw any attack at all. Here are some scenes actually taken close to the beach where the ships made a right angle turn 
and headed for the area where we were to land. <coughs> that is a DE boat in the distance. And uh, of course, we were on the alert for any kind of attack, even airplane attacks. Fortunately, our Air Force did their job well, and at no time <coughs> did I know of a German attack except after we had landed, two planes attempted to strafe the beach. <coughs> and I happened to be in the area. Now, these are some scenes that I, that I took uh, with uh, a, my camera that was reduced to 16 millimeter. This particular scene of these men going ashore was taken by an automatic camera aboard a British landing craft. And they were the first men to land. The reason that it was taken by an automatic camera was because they wanted to have a record of what happened should the a landing fail. At least they might have a record if they were able to recover the film of what happened and how to avoid it if they had to try another attack. But here are some scenes landing on the Utah beach and this is the way we went ashore. This is again is at the British beach but you notice the men didn't dash ashore after being aboard a landing craft for five solid days. They just walked slowly and cautiously fearful of bombs and uh, mines that were sown in the area. You notice they had their rifles wrapped in cellophane. But this is the way we had to go ashore. And I needn't tell you that a lot of the boys didn't make it. Here is one of the famous scenes taken from black and white film of two men being shot down right before your eyes. Here is Pete Carroll and Wes Haynes carrying our own equipment. And uh, the ship is grounded on the beach. The uh, section of the beach we were on was being attacked by enemy fire. And uh, in the previous shot, you could see a bomb actually land not too far from where we were. There it is again. And the bulldozers were trying to clear roads uh, to let our jeeps and tanks move forward. And even though it was June, the area was quite cold, as it usually is in that part of Normandy. Of course, the men dug their foxholes a little deeper, and we had the good fortune of finding a concrete wall which helped serve as protection. But even now, we're taking some of our wounded back to the beach so they can be transferred back to England. But when the tide went out, the ships could not come in close, or those that went aground had to wait for tide, tide to be refloated if they weren't hit. We stayed on the beach the first night and lived in a foxhole. And soon, we showed some of the first prisoners taken in the area late the first day who were captured close to the beach and uh, were sent back to England because there was no room to keep them there. This is our first command post where General Collins on the left is talking to some of his officers. And uh, we were able to get some of the first uh, hot food at this place and I didn't realize how hungry I was until I saw these pictures. There's Larry Lesur again and Bob Landry on the right. Bob Landry was covering the war for time and life. And although it kept me very busy for eight solid days, I used up all the film I had and decided to go back to France to get some more and probably to get a bath. I hadn't had my clothes off during that entire time. And my <coughs> landing at England took place at a place near Bournemouth. It almost looks like the cliffs of Dover that everyone is familiar with, but uh, it was a beautiful sight to see the coast of England and know that I could uh, get some rest after a while. But didn't realize it at that time that the buzz bombs would start coming over, and here we see some of them flying over the English coastline. And uh, these buzz bombs were a terror weapon. They didn't know where they would land, but the British were quick to set up uh, machine guns and any aircraft fire to knock them out of the sky. And they managed to shoot down quite a few. They even sent planes up into the sky to knock them out of the air. And uh, of course, sometimes they did get through. And where they fell, they caused considerable damage. but you must have missed that pretty good shooting. There's one actually coming down, and it landed in the London area, and wherever they landed, they caused considerable damage. My second crossing 
of the channel was made on an LST, and this time with units of the 3rd Armor Division that was sorely needed because they were bringing over more tanks and uh, vehicles to carry us in the direction of Cherbourg because we needed a port badly. The uh, LST was manned by a British crew. That's the captain in the British uniform. But uh, we were in uh, a long convoy of many of them, everyone loaded to the gills with equipment that was sorely needed. But here you'll get an idea of what the beach looked like. And these ships are actually waiting for the tide to recede so they could send their equipment ashore without going through deep water. On D-Day, they had to go through the deep water. And at this particular moment, they're waiting for the ramps to be rebuilt after a severe storm so they could go ashore without damage. Now, you can see the problems they had on D-Day because when the landing craft hit the sandbars, the men started wading ashore and found deeper water ahead, and those that had their life preservers too low around their waist turned turtle, and many were drowned. But these are units of the 3rd Army heading in, crossing the deep spot just ahead of them, and headed toward Cherbourg itself. This was a remarkable sight, and the ships were lined up as far as the eye could see, bringing supplies ashore. We needed Cherbourg badly because we thought we could use it as a port, but we found that Cherbourg, shown here, was pretty badly destroyed by the Germans themselves. They destroyed the docks, which we thought we could use, and it took them, if I recall, almost two months before we could bring a ship in. They set up mines and uh, destroyed the famous uh, Cherbourg docks where the uh, transatlantic liners used to land. They not only destroyed the docks, but also the inland bridges that crossed the rivers that entered the Cherbourg area, the canals. Uh, this is one of them was destroyed by the Germans. Soon the French people came back into the city and gave us a warm welcome. And soon we found the prisoners, and I think they took something like 16 or 18,000 men out of the Cherbourg area, and they're still holding their personal belongings, marching toward the beaches because they had to be transported to England and some eventually to the States to be held in prisoner of war camps. And even at this time, those that could talk to us or would talk to us said we'd be pushed back into the channel in less than a week. Of course, at every uh, headquarters area, we found uh, that the Germans had a picture of Herr Hitler, and our boys are using it as a pinboard. But uh, the Americans had a way of amusing themselves. Now, here is the first official ceremony held in France when General Collins on the right presented the tricolor fad flag made out of parachute cloth, seen here, to the mayor of Cherbourg, who was holding the microphone. And our boys of the Seventh Corps were given clean uniforms for the occasion. And soon, the people that came back to Cherbourg after the fighting stopped came to visit with us and talk to us. Here we see Ernie Pyle in the center again and talking to a colonel of the Signal Corps. And uh, this is Bert Brandt, who we saw earlier uh, shooting for AP. Uh, Cecil Carnes and John McGlincy. Uh, and here is, uh, oh gosh, 25 years has done a lot to my memory. But uh, the troops began to move in the opposite direction to attack the enemy on the St. Lowe line. And we were passing through the city of Valone, and of course it was completely destroyed. I was there several times since the war, and it's been rebuilt beautifully. But the Germans tried to make a stand here, and wherever they did try to make a stand, we had to knock them out, and in so doing, destroy the city. A little later on, I had an opportunity to see the construction that was built by slave labor. And uh, all along the beach, especially in the Normandy area, as well as other areas, they built these triangles. Many of them had uh, 
mines attached to them so that if a boat touched them, uh, they would explode. And uh, I was told after taking this walk that uh, I should be very careful not to step where the ground is soft. This is a church in Barfleur that was a pretty little town that the Germans evacuated because the commander liked the city so much, the little town so much, that he didn't want to see it destroyed and just actually withdrew rather than let it be destroyed. It was a little fishing village. And uh, I had the good fortune of coming back several times because the hotel was still intact and serving very excellent French food. A little further down the coast, we found these fortifications built by slave labor and even these metal fences just to keep us from landing in the area. And these uh, heavy fortifications that were many feet thick, and these correspondents were looking it over. In some areas, the Germans saw to it that they were destroyed, uh, blowing them up so that we couldn't use them against them if they tried to take them back. They even destroyed their own weapons. But we noticed that the walls and fortifications were very thick and very strong. The area was taken over by the Navy, and there was an observation post right on the end. This was in a near a town called Granville, and uh, there is the lighthouse at the point that sort of separated Normandy from Brittany. And that's the observation post the Germans used, and it's under the command of our naval officers uh, to use as an observation post. Soon we brought in some of our big armament, and they were set up in a field and firing at German positions. But even though the guns were firing, the French people were bringing in the crops as though nothing was happening. This surprised me, and uh, I couldn't help but uh, wanting to make a picture of it. Of course, these heavy guns caused a terrific concussion, and uh, it was difficult to hold a handheld camera that long. One of the first uh, things that the Americans did was to build an airstrip in the St. Saint Mary Gleese area. Uh, not far from the coast, and they used a strip that was supported by metal f wire to keep the planes from sinking into the ground. And uh, they were using it also as a place to take off from with 500-pound bombs under each wing. But the strip was so rough that frequently the bombs would break loose, and even though they were armed, uh, they had to be disarmed and taken off the runway. These are P-47s that they were using here, and uh, there, there's one carrying a bomb under each wing to attack the enemy deep in behind the lines. Uh, you notice these two planes taking off at once, raising considerable dust, but managing to get off a very short runway. <clears throat> and here you notice a plane, you notice the buckle under the wheels. Uh, this sometimes caused the mesh wire to break and come up and hit the plane's propeller, causing it to crash before it left the ground. And here's an unfortunate accident, two of our planes. Here we see some pictures made by automatic cameras in, that were installed in the fighter planes because when a pilot reported that he had shot down an enemy plane, he wasn't given credit unless his pictures proved that the plane was shot down. And uh, these automatic uh, cameras would uh, operate in conjunction with his machine guns. And if you look closely, you'll see the pilot jump out of the plane in the, in the shot. But you notice, too, that a lot of these planes are still carrying the extra fuel tanks that they were carrying underneath the wing. And whenever the bullets hit that tank, the plane would explode, as you will see here. But when you saw shots like this, you know that the pilot never got back. And one of the highlights of our trip across uh, France was Mont Saint-Michel. Mont Saint-Michel was on a river that separated Normandy from Brittany. 
And here we met some of the other correspondents. This is Bob Capper of Time Magazine, and I know there's a member in the audience who uh, knew Bob Capper. And Bob Capper was eventually killed. He was covering the war in Indochina when the French was fighting. But at Mont Saint-Michel, we found uh, the Poulard Hotel run by Madame Poulard. And the reason we liked the place is she served some delicious omelets for which she was famous. And that's Madame Poulard and her famous hotel in the background. And uh, a lot of the correspondents gathered here to fight the war from this point because we were closer to the front line, if you could call it such, uh, than we were at our main bases. And there we see the river that separates Normandy from Brittany. This is a beautiful little island, and the building at the top is a monastery that was still intact. It was not destroyed at all. And here are some of our GIs looking over the sites of the <coughs> monastery, being shown around by a woman guide. <coughs> Soon we met some of the other correspondents we knew, and here we see Charles Collingwood, the uh, gentleman on the right, with Helen Kirkpatrick of the Chicago Daily News, and Joe Liebling of New Yorker Magazine, the ball-headed chap, and Werdenbecker on the extreme left. Liebling uh, wrote many stories for New Yorker Magazine, and he uh, died not many years ago. This is Charles Collingwood and uh, Helen Kirkpatrick of the uh, Chicago Daily News. This is Ernie, uh, rather, Ernest Hemingway. Hemingway was covering for Collier's Magazine, and we met him at uh, Mont Saint-Michel. Here he is seen talking with Bill Walton, who uh, incidentally became a fast friend of uh, President Kennedy. And these were just moments that we could take a little time out to rest. There's Helen Kirkpatrick, and uh, the man in the center in this picture is Bill Stringer, and he was killed trying to get into Paris. One of the things that correspondents tried to do was to get into Paris before anyone else, and uh, he was hit by an 88 shell. But uh, this is just a moment of relaxation. We had a few, and of course, uh, these are the shots I wanted to bring home to the family and friends. But uh, the little island was very quaint, and it was a very old place, but it was fortified in several ways. We discovered that the beaches on, in the area, uh, especially when the tide was out, would be high and dry, and they put those sticks in the sand to keep our planes from landing. We found a little family of three brothers, and this, they're, they're, even the tall blonde one was a boy, I found out later, because their grandmother was taking care of them. Their parents, I was told, were killed at the Battle of St. Lowe. One afternoon, rather late, I walked out behind the island because as the sun was setting, I could get some interesting shots of the island from the seaside because uh, they have an extremely high tide here and would leave the island high and dry, but the tide would come in real fast and there was always danger of quicksand, so I didn't stand in one place too long. But the receding waters left this unusual design in the sand. We didn't stay at Mont Saint-Michel very long, but continued on deeper into France. In fact, I went into Brittany for a while and discovered that uh, the boys had found a lake there, which we'll see in a moment. But the countryside was beautiful. It was during the summer, and the crops were still in the field. But our boys, after washing out of a helmet for many <laughs> weeks, decided to use this beautiful lake for a bath. They were permitted to do so because they were fighting the enemy at an area called St. Malo. And incidentally, you probably recall, the Germans held out at St. Malo for many months, almost to the end of the war. And of course, it's the American sense of humor that helped them win the war, too. But here are some of the correspondents that uh, we sometimes travel together, and we found a little river that uh, proved to be useful as a bath. <clears throat> the, uh, there are a lot of these small rivers around France, and uh, at every moment that we could spare, 
the correspondence. This is a group of them. That's Ralph Moss uh, in the front, and Huey Broderick, and, and Joe Priestley. And of course, here we see Edward G. Robinson. Edward G. Robinson was one of the many actors and actresses that came to Normandy to entertain our troops. And uh, they held a, a show right in this Normandy barn that was not too far from the fighting. And I found out later that the intermission had to be called when the shells came too close. Of course, all you had to do was point a camera at Robinson, and he acted. Soon we found ourselves in Rambouillet. Rambouillet was 52 kilometers from Paris and was the uh, headquarters for the, all the correspondents that came there. We see Ernie Pyle again on the left, and George Stevens, the Hollywood director, myself and, uh, of course, Pete Carroll. Uh, it was shortly after these pictures were taken that uh, Ernie Pyle decided to return back to the States and then went to the Pacific where he was killed. George Stevens uh, was a very well-known Hollywood director, I'm sure you recall, and he uh, died only a few years ago. But practically every correspondent turned out to try to get into the city of Paris. but. Uh, we found, as I said earlier, that the General Eisenhower had given permission to the Second French Armor Division to take the city of Paris because the important thing was to destroy the enemy. And they didn't consider Paris as a target. It would delay them if they did try to take the city themselves. They wanted to circumvent the city because uh, <clears throat> they wanted to give the honor to the French. General Leclerc was in command of the Second Armor Division, and he uh, refused to let the correspondents accompany his force to get into the city, uh, simply because he didn't want any shots made until he had the city secure. Uh, we were glad to see Paris because it was uh, a city of great beauty, and uh, we were amazed at the way the people turned out. And these are some of the shots taken on the first day of liberation. I just didn't nearly get enough of these shots because there was too much to do. And soon General de Gaulle came into the city and paraded down the Champs Elysees. And here he is taking the salute and receiving some flowers from a French girl. It must be remembered that de Gaulle was not well known at this time and uh, very few people could listen to the re radio reports that told about his work in England prior to crossing the channel, but soon he became very popular. It seemed as though everybody in Paris turned out to see de Gaulle, and he was marching down the Champs-Élysées at this point, and it was a tremendous sight to see. <clears throat> uh, later in the day, our own troops paraded down the avenue, and uh, this was something that made us all proud. And here's de Gaulle parading, and suddenly firing opened up, from uh, uh, forces that were left behind, and they thought from the FFE and some of the fascists that were still in the city trying to panic the people. But if you stuck your head out a window, you were bound to lose it. And this went on continuously for several hours. In fact, uh, I was in the middle of this thing, and these are shots that I took of people lying flat on the ground. They'd get under our car, we couldn't move the car while uh, they were trying to get the people to stop shooting by raising white flags. But it went on continuously, and although it was small arm fire, de, de Gaulle just stood his ground. Mother wasn't taking any chances. But this, this is the way the streets of Paris looked on the Day of Liberation. <clears throat> they did catch some of these people who were responsible for the shooting, at least they told us that, and unfortunately they beat him to death right on the spot. It was a rather ugly sight to see, but uh, somehow it was the war of nerves. Some of the buildings still contained Germans that were at headquarter points, and uh, they were sworn at by the French. These are some shots made late in the day of the American troops marching through the streets of the city on the way to the front lines. Uh, wherever we stopped, the French were there to trade champagne for cigarettes and to talk to us and find out what was going on. 
We were able to see the city. It wasn't badly destroyed. There was some small arms fire. The lion lost his tail. But generally speaking, all the bridges were intact over the city. And uh, the, uh, this is the opera house. And it, it, since it was my first trip to Paris, I enjoyed seeing the beautiful city of Paris. Soon the people of Paris were out parading again along the Champs-Élysées with their newfound liberty. We discovered that the Eiffel Tower, which was reported destroyed and used for arms, was still intact. And uh, soon I managed to get permission to go up into the Eiffel Tower and see what it looked like from up above. But uh, there was much to be done. And even though the Paris looked beautiful, conditions were very poor. The railroads were practically destroyed. There was no way of bringing in food. In fact, when we were coming down the road, we saw large trucks waiting to get into the city, loaded with all kinds of foodstuffs uh, to support the city, which uh, was in dire need not only of food, but of coal, because at this time it was getting pretty cold. It was late in the year, and uh, there was no way of getting supplies in. These are scenes from the Eiffel Tower showing the Seine and the buildings close to the Eiffel Tower. And we see some troops parading through the streets. But uh, we had to move on, and soon I had to leave Paris and uh, found myself in the countryside uh, beyond Paris and went into Belgium, uh, where I managed to get into uh, Brussels. Uh, these are some scenes of uh, the Otoy racetrack, which we found was open shortly after the liberation. This surprised everyone, but they made them close the track after a few days of meeting. But one of the things that did surprise everyone is how well dressed the French women were, and they had a way of uh, using whatever they had to make themselves look really attractive. And I understand this annoyed some of the other allied countries very much to think that they could get by like that. They even opened up the art galleries along the streets, and uh, we didn't know whether they were permitted to do this prior to our getting there, but they certainly opened up for business uh, very shortly after we arrived. We found a painter at work in the old quarter of Paris. And uh, shortly after leaving Paris, I was in an area called the Ardennes. And the reason I took some of these shots of the countryside, because the weather was turning cold, and the trees were turning their fall colors. And this is the town of Hoofalies, which was completely destroyed on the, the breakthrough that occurred and the attack on, the, uh, on Bastogne. I was in Bastogne just a few days before the breakthrough and was fortunate enough to get out of there, not knowing about the attack. But I did uh, think that this was a place that the enemy could hide troops, and they did. That's General Collins again, talking to General Morris Rose, who was in command of the 3rd Armored Division. Uh, this is General Rose on the left. General Rose was killed in Cologne. It was an unfortunate happening because they thought they had the place protected, but there were some enemy troops in the area, and he was shot. These are units of the 3rd Armored Division that were fighting the enemy, and uh, we uh, managed to get some shots of them as they were being uh, entertained by German children. We had a tremendous reception all the way across France, but when we got to Germany, the reception was not there. Uh, all the homes uh, in the German area had white flags in front of them as an indication, of course, of surrender. And uh, the children here were actually on their way to school. And <coughs> children everywhere look cute. And they're holding their ears because our guns are firing not far away. And they were just trying to avoid the, the noise. We found the Siegfried Line, as it was called, or the Dragon's Teeth, were which were built again by slave labor, I'm told. 
and they were not a fortification against our tanks because our bulldozers took dirt and pushed it over the top of them and rode right over the top. But we found these fortifications stretched out from one end of Germany to the other because somehow they felt that we'd perhaps get to Germany and they were trying to keep us out, but they didn't succeed, of course. Uh, the war was moving rather rapidly at some points in Germany, and soon I found myself in the town of Aachen. Aachen was under fire when these pictures were taken. That's the reason the scenes are devoid of people. There were mortar shells passing over our heads all the time, and uh, the enemy was holding the center of the city as uh, we were making these shots, and we were just uh, wondering uh, how long the battle would take, and we discovered that uh, the troops were just down behind that mold or that wreckage in the distance, and soon we discovered that these reserves were just a block or two behind the front line, and they were waiting to be called in. I was told later on that the captain you saw in the picture a moment ago Somebody in the audience knew him and said he was killed in the action that took place shortly after that. Well, after Aachen, I was invited to fly home, and uh, this is something I was glad to be able to do because uh, here we see some of the cemeteries that were built on the Normandy beaches above the beaches, and uh, these are scenes of Berlin showing the tremendous damage that occurred in the city. The bombings were intense, and very little of Berlin was left standing. It shows that wars don't seem to prove very much except to destroy property and kill people. And we sometimes think that maybe one day we'll learn how to avoid wars, and perhaps we've made wars so deadly that uh, we'll have to avoid them in the long run to stay alive. Soon I was able to photograph some of the events when General Eisenhower came back to the States and was greeted in Kansas City. These shots were made with a telephoto lens uh, at quite a distance. Then I was able to visit uh, the collection of some of the weapons the Germans used uh, just after the invasion. This is the V-2 rocket that followed the V-1s. The V-1s were a terror weapon and the V-2s were certainly the same, but that was the first time they used rockets, and they were able to shoot them great distances. The V-1s, uh, and I heard many of them come overhead, were like a motorcycle engine, and whenever the motor stopped, it would uh, cause the bomb to drop. The Germans had jet planes in the air before the war ended, and here is one that they actually used, and it showed a record of many American planes, and uh, if you notice, 42 Russians were shot down by this plane before it was captured by our side. And in this exhibit, we see one of the Japanese kamikaze bombs that was on exhibition, and one of our pilots is trying it for size. And they didn't like the idea that you only had a one-way ticket because uh, they were intended to destroy the target they were after and the pilot with it. This plane, I was told, was built by the enemy to bomb New York, and uh, it could fly the ocean and back, and they appropriately named it Alice Kaput. Here we see some shots of what I call the, what the next war might look like, and this is the explosion of the atomic bomb in New Mexico. And, uh, I always uh, like to feel when I show these pictures that perhaps it'll remind people that we ought to remember what World War II was like and that World War III would be much worse. But uh, I like to say that, uh, repeat what one scientist aptly put it when he said the atomic bomb is here to stay. The question is, are we? And that brings us to the end of our film, and thank you very much.
Very familiar. Very familiar. You remember it. Well, the pictures have lasted. They're beginning to fade, I'm afraid. And uh, I guess uh, in time, I, I fortunately have a print of it and uh, try to keep them fresh as long as I can. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, these were shot, of course, at moments of relaxation. I did uh, many thousands of feet in 35 millimeter, which were used in theatrical release. But uh, <coughs> you needed four hands to <laughs> operate two cameras. You must have had to guard your film, didn't you, for the pussy? Well, I have a little secret to tell about the film. I, I took along a limited amount of film. But uh, the Signal Corps, whenever film was out of date, would not want to use it. If it was one day past the dateline, they'd destroy it. And I managed to get some of it, and it proved to be perfectly usable, and I was able to get it. Some of the film was processed in England, and uh, one roll that was very green uh, was uh, uh, used in, it uh, was lost for a while, and then I had it processed, and the color didn't come out as well. But uh, they tell me that this is some of the few pictures that were made in color of the invasion. But the idea was to bring back pictures of some friends who are no longer with us anymore. Well, we appreciate very much. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I appreciate your kind attention.